Welcome to this presentation on sociotechnical epistemology, which we just pre-recorded this morning because I can't be with you in Montreal right now, but I will be with you in the question and answer session live. So the topic of my presentation is sociotechnical epistemology, and I want to tell you a little bit about what this is and why this may be of interest to you. Before I start, let me talk a little bit about some epistemic reflections about what I think knowledge processes are and what is at the center of my inquiries. If you think about knowledge practices today in academia as well as in everyday life, you will notice that these knowledge processes are on the one hand highly social and on the other hand highly technologically mediated. This is the case in education, in laboratories, uh, in scientific publishing, but also in more mundane everyday practices such as using Wikipedia, Google, recommender systems, location-based services, etc. So the problem or the interesting question for me is that in knowing we rely in numerous more or less transparent ways on other agents, human agents, as much as non-human agents, infrastructures and technologies. Technologies of information, computation and communication have profoundly changed our knowledge practices in research just as much as in everyday life. And just remember the examples which I gave on the previous slide, but think also of new forms of data analysis, new research methods, etc., which is particularly vital for web science uh, as, as a community. Since I am based in philosophy, my claim is that these changes in knowledge practices have been insufficiently addressed within philosophy, and this is partly due to disciplinary boundaries. Um, on the one hand, um, disciplines being interested in knowledge, not, not necessarily being interested in technology. So the point of departure from which I'm trying to develop this notion of socio-technical epistemology is social epistemology. It is a philosophical subdiscipline which is addressing the social dimensions of knowledge, and here you can see some of the book covers of some of the most prominent um, uh, participants in the discourse on social epistemology, such as Alvin Goldman, Helen Longino, or Martin Kusch. Classical topics within the realm of social epistemologies are testimony and trust, distribution of epistemic labor, consensus formation, judgment aggregation, etc. And in the following, I want to briefly introduce you into the topic of testimony and trust and what this means in social epistemology in order to show you afterwards how this needs to be reconsidered if we want to think about um, knowledge practices as not only social but so socio-technical. So what is this debate on testimony and trust about? In philosophy, testimony is what other people tell us. Uh, more broadly speaking, so it does not only refer to legal settings, but more generally what people tell us. It is there considered to be the fourth route to knowledge in addition to perception, memory and inference. Here's a quote by one of the most prominent epistemologists of, um, of, te of testimony, um, 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 Lecky, who writes, almost everything we know depends in some way on testimony. Without the ability to learn from others, it would be virtually impossible for any individual person to know much beyond what has come within the scope of her immediate perceptual environment. The fruits of science, history, geography, all of these would be beyond our grasp, as would, mu would much of what we know about ourselves. Another quote by Fricker, she writes, We citizens of the 21st century live in a world where division of epistemic labor rules. Most of what we know we learn from the spoken or written words of others, and we depend in endless practical ways on the technological fruits of the dispersed knowledge of others, of which we often know almost nothing in virtually every moment of our lives. And think back to the picture, and this is clearly indicative of it. And what is interesting is that Fricker is already referring to not only the spoken word, but also the written word and the technological fruits. So there's also already a reference to the technological mediation of these knowledge processes. So this is what I said testimony is, but in philosophy it is usually considered to be an inferior route to knowledge and more fallible than other sources, primarily because other people could lie to you, so intentionally mislead you. And this is most often um, attributed to, to Locke, uh, which I'm quoting here from a book by Cody. I hope it will not be thought arrogance to say that perhaps we should make greater progress in the discovery of rational and contemplative knowledge if we sought it in the fountain in the consideration of things themselves and made use rather of our own thoughts than others' men's to find it. For I think we may as rationally hope to see with other men's eyes as to know by other men's understanding. 
the floating of other men's opinion in our brains makes us not yon what one yacht the more knowing, though they happen to be true. What in them was science is in us but opinionatory. So this is the core of this epistemic individualism, where you cannot know through the words of others, but rather have to think through everything on your own. So to summarize, this is a dilemma um, of, of testimony and trust. While the vast majority of our knowledge depends on testimony, the status of knowledge acquired through testimony is still highly disputed, and this is often attributed to what is called a pervasive epistemic individualism in Western philosophy, where knowers are very often perceived as isolated individuals. So this was my introduction to what testimony uh, is in social epistemology, and just to give you a bit of an idea of other major topics, this will be very brief. Distribution of epistemic labor in social epistemology, this refers very often to the question uh, posed by Philip Kitcher, how do we best design social institutions for the advancement of learning? The philosophers have ignored the social structure of science, the point, however, is to change it. So the question then is, how should cognitive labor be distributed to enable the largest possible gain in significant truth? This is again Kitcher's words. And you can think about how to distribute uh, workload and research effort at the level of scientific communities or within research teams. Consensus formation is yet another important topic within social epistemology. And it basically refers to the question when consensus in science <coughs> is epistemically appropriate and when does premature consensus on, diff on specific methods or specific theories in different scientific fields stifle scientific advances? And here there have been uh, many contributions by, for instance, Longino, Solomon, Kitcher, but many others as well. The second question is then, if consensus is desired, how should it best be achieved? And a very prominent approach uh, has been provided, provided by Keith Lehrer and Wagner, which is in, in their book Rational Consensus in Science and Society, and basically what they propose is to combine social information understand, understood as information about the competency and honesty of peers within science with empirical information about the subject matter to better achieve epistemic results. This is a bit similar to, to Delphi methodologies where you um, also assess the competency, where you can self-assess your own competency with respect to a subject matter. Um, and you will, I will get back to this later on because this social information is, of course, nothing or not much different from reputational cues uh, online nowadays. <clears throat> so if we want to summarize this very brief introduction into social epistemology, we can say, at least that is my claim, that within social epistemology there is either complete neglect of technology or very inadequate models of technology. Moreover, what is also often neglected is the power, the relationships between power and knowledge. <clears throat> My claim is what we need is to reconsider socio-epistemological uh, so, um, socio mechanisms such as the ones described before, now as socio-technical epistemic mechanisms. The focus should always also be on the relationship between knowledge and power, and there's a need to relate epistemology to ethics, ontology, and politics. And I will explain this in a bit more detail in the next minutes. <clears throat> So if we want to change social epistemology and develop something called socio-technical epistemology, where can we draw um, inspiration from? And I think clearly um, there are fields within philosophy, such as philosophy of technology, philosophy of computing and computer ethics, but also influences, influences from other disciplines, such as science and technology studies, web science, but also, which is for me very important, feminist theory. The main insights that I draw from these other fields concern the entanglement between the social, the technical, and the epistemic, the relationship between human and non-human agents, the relationship between values and technologies, and the performativity of epistemic practices and systems. And this, of course, is in a nutshell, but just to give you an idea that where I draw my resources when I want to move from social epistemology to socio-technical epistemology. So what then is socio-technical epistemology? <clears throat> Remember, these were the topics... Um, that I, that I mentioned before. So let us reconsider the first topic, testimony and trust, under socio-technical premises. As we have heard, in testimony there has been a strong focus on testimonial exchange between a speaker and a hearer to gain knowledge. However, if you think back to this picture, we already realized 
that it's not really one person only speaking to another person, but these processes of communication are highly mediated by technological means. So that means in science, but also beyond uh, in everyday life, trust is not only placed in other people, other scientists or technicians, but also in other entities such as procedures, processes and methods, institutions and organizations, content and existing knowledge, instruments, technologies, particularly computer technologies. And of course, the trust between these entities is related. I may trust some evidence because the researcher providing it comes from a reputable institution or because it is published in a reputable venue. Moreover, and this is an interesting and a very important book by Donald McKenzie, Mechanizing Proof, Computing Risk and Trust. In this book, he basically provides an historical analysis of the early days of AI and, um, well, basically cryptography. And he writes that most aspects of our private and social life depend on computing. And how can we know that computing is trustworthy? In this book, he compares human mathematical proof with formal automated proof and in these analysis, he basically concludes that yet the human community is now not the only trustworthy agent to which to turn. It has been joined by the machine. Modernity's trust in numbers can, it appears, lead back to a grounding not in trust in people, but trust in machines. So it seems that even in mathematics and in, in, in computer science, there's an increasing trust in machines for even the core epistemological functions, such as proving, um, uh, just uh, such as providing a mathematical proof. The same is of course true in empirical sciences or in physics. Uh, and there's a book by Paul Humphreys, extending our selves computational science, empiricism, and, and scientific methods. And what he writes is similar now for other fields of research, scientific knowledge he writes, is not limited to what human senses can provide. Senses can be augmented by instruments and new forms of mathematics, such as simulations. Many calculations in physics are too complex to be conducted by humans alone. They depend on computers. However, this leads to the problem of epistemic opacity. That is, when a computational process is too fast for humans to follow in detail, or when there is no explicit algorithm linking inputs to outputs. So here again, we have to ask, where do we have to start trusting when we use simulations and other complex mathematical methods to generate knowledge? And what are the epistemological implications of this trust in uh, specific types of mechanisms? So it seems that technologies of information communication, but also computation, play a special and triple role for epistemic trust. On the one hand, ICT or technologies of computing as well can be an entity of trust themselves. Uh, for instance, you can trust a computer in a sense as you can trust or not trust a car. But ICT also are very often mediators of trust relationships between humans and human agents as well as between human agents and other types of entities such as content. You can for instance ask how does Skype or Facebook affect our trust relations between humans or how do search engines, Wikipedia, recommender systems affect our trust and content. Moreover, and this is something I'm not going to talk about today, there is the question of trust in multi-agent systems. Uh, that means the trust relations amongst artificial agents as well as between human and artificial agents. Uh, and this is another valid and important uh, topic for inquiry as well. So the last, just uh, to give you an idea, this is what I'm, uh, these questions of trust in socio-technical environments are what I'm focusing on in a, uh, in a, in a, in a project that I'm leading at the University of Vienna, uh, it's entitled Epistemic Trust and Socio-Technical Epistemic Systems, and the goal is to reassess uh, the concept and the central problems of epistemic trust um, by taking into account that contemporary practices of trusting to know take place within dynamic and entangled socio-technical epistemic systems consisting of multiple human and non-human agents. So it is really about this tension between trusting and knowing. Uh, this is what epistemic trust refers to. So, as you can see um, from the small STE on top of testimony and trust, what I tried to provide in the last minutes was to give you a bit of an idea about how discourses on testimony and trust need to be reconsidered under socio-technical premises. But of course, the same needs to be done for all the other topics in social epistemology, such as the distribution of epistemic labor. If we include technologies here now, we have to, of course, think about the distribution of labor over human and non-human agents. The same is true for consensus formation. We have to get a grip on automated forms of consensus formation, on e-deliberation, 
all these tools are available online for different purposes. And I think epistemologists need to focus on these practices and maybe need to reconsider how they think about consensus formation now that we have these more automated forms. And of course, most notably, judgment aggregation, it's one of the core underlying processes on Web 2.0 technologies. Think about all the ratings, rankings, reputation mechanisms. These are now all automated forms that need to be assessed from a epistemological, that is from a socio-technical epistemological perspective. So these were just some of the core topics that have been attributed and need to be reconsidered. However, there are of course also new topics that need to be uh, scrutinized by epistemologists to understand what is going on in terms of knowledge creation. These topics include, but are of course not limited to, argument extraction and visualization, uh, crowdsourced crisis mapping and big data. Um, so just to give you some ideas, uh, argument extraction being about the idea of, no, of, of extracting arguments out of social media content and trying to visualize different arguments to counter them, to give a more balanced uh, landscape of, of opinions and arguments instead of just doing this on the level of words. Crowdsource crisis mapping would be the idea of using web content uh, in, 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 uh, in moments of crisis, be it uh, during warfare, but also for bushfires, etc. And there are specific technical but also ethical and legal challenges which are colliding um, in, these, uh, in these cases. The topic of big data is the last one, of course, which has been uh, increasingly received a lot of a uh, lot of interest in the last uh, years, and I want to focus on this for the remaining part of my presentation. So, what is big data? And I want to, before I go into the details, I want to start with a short example to give you some idea um, uh, about what the what the interesting questions around big data may be from an epistemological perspective. Maybe some of you have heard about this incident, which I think was reported in two thousand and twelve when um, there was um, a father calling Target because they received some brochures and advertisement for pregnancy-related products, and the father was sort of like outrageous on the phone uh, telling this person from Target that why they are sending these, uh, these um, brochures to them. Um, there's nobody pregnant, and if they want to incentivize them to be so. Anyway, he was sort of like outraged to have received um, these uh, these coupons for pregnancy related products. Um, the person from Target supposedly uh, apologized, uh, told the father that he's very sorry and he's going to inquire that. Um, so he called. So he called back to the father a week later, uh, again apologizing for what had happened. And the father on the telephone was supposedly rather. Um, quiet and said he had to apologize himself. There had been a miscommunication uh, flaw in their family. It turned out that their 16-year-old daughter indeed was pregnant but hadn't told their parents. So why am I telling you this story? Or the other question is, what is the problem uh, in that case of the family learning that the, uh, the teenage daughter was pregnant through a uh, target? Of course, the most immediate reaction would be to think about invasion of privacy. But however, this is problematic because um, one can assume that the, the coupons um, were, were sent to the family because they have bought one of these um, bonus cards or payback cards where basically you voluntarily or give informed consent through um, through Target or other companies monitoring your consumer behavior in order to, to give you some benefits. So you can't really talk about, or maybe you can't really talk about Ill illegitimate access to data because of this informed consent to the payback cards. So what I think is a more interesting approach, rather than going via privacy, um, is to think about um, big data in different terms. So the invasion of privacy in that case is not due to the gathering of data, I argue, but due to the data processing and the inferences made after this data has been gathered. So this is about big data practices as epistemic practices, that means as knowledge practices, which have certain ethical, legal and political implications. But I think we need to take a look at the very specific knowledge practices before we can think about um, what the ethical, legal and political implications is. Or let's put it differently, we need to think these questions together. 
So let us talk a little bit about what big data is. In the quite um, famous book by Maya Schoenfelder and Couquier, they just define big data through three terms. Uh, it's more data, it's fuzzy data, and they have this claim that correlation supersedes causation, which of course is much contested, uh, and I'm not going to go into the details of this uh, right now. A more nuanced um, description about what big data is, is has been provided by Rob Kitchen. He writes, big data is huge in volume, high in velocity, diverse in variety, exhaustive in scope, fine grade in resolution, relational in nature, and flexible, holding traits both of extensionality and scalability. So if we think about big data in these terms, I think what is important is that we also need to think about who collects big data or data in general. Uh, and I think we need to distinguish, broadly speaking, four different types of, um, of collectors. Science and academia, states, companies, and users themselves. And what is important, it is important to notice these differences because the data collection in, for these four different types of actors has very different functions and has very different implications. So what we need is very nuanced analysis. What I want to start with is big data collection in science academia because it is very often a neglected aspect of big data practices. So if we think about science, science for the longest time has been, um, has been well, has had processes of data collection, if you wish. In biology, um, you know, for the longest time also um, um, amateurs have been collecting um, uh, data, butterflies, all sorts of things, and this is sort of like in the core of biology as a science, or you can see here one of the first telescopes by Galilei. So, so in the different, uh, in bi not only biology, but also in astronomy, you have big data collection, at least data collection, and of course also um, in the social science and humanities, um, there has been data collections um, since the very origins of these, of these disciplines. Um, as is here indicated by a picture of Francis Galton, one of the four founders of, um, of well, data processing in the social science and humanities. Of course, what is happening right now is that the amount of data gathered in these different disciplines has changed. Um, so, for instance, in biology, you have databases such as Flybase, which is trying to collect uh, data for, uh, for different organism, uh, organisms in a very comprehensive sense. We have different, um, of course, uh, forms of data, massive da data gathering in astronomy, uh, and of course also in the social science and humanities, and I just used here the logo of the Oxford Internet Institute as one institution um, out of many who, of course, do computational social science and, and digital humanities. One of the questions uh, is, is there now happening a paradigm shift now that we have more data, different types of data? What does it do with science that we have now new modes of data gathering? And I want to give you some examples about what these potential changes in science may be. In a book by, in an article by Rob Kitchen, which was just published, uh, which is called Big Data, New Epistemologies and Paradigm Shifts, Kitchen is basically arguing that big data and novel forms of data analysis can be considered or should be considered as disruptive technologies. And he is considering big data to be really a paradigm shift. And what is important is in this paradigm shift, where, where we find that there are new and contested epistemologies, that different disciplines and different um, scientists want to make new claims about what knowledge uh, should be gathered and how it should be gathered and what the implications are. He's basically distinguishing two different types of claims. On the one hand, what he labels a new form of empiricism um, related to Chris Anderson's claims about the end of theory and a purely data-driven science, and he contrasts this with approaches uh, in, in digital humanities and computational social science. Let me first turn to this new form of empiricism and how he characterizes it. What Kitchen does in this article, he's basically uh, taking claims from some of these proponents of this new empiricism and then he contradicts these claims to show that this is not really the case, that there's no end of theory um, and that, change, that the changes are not as envisioned by these new empiricists. One of the claims that he finds in the literature um, is that big data can capture a whole of a domain and provide full resolution. According to Kitchen, 
Uh, data formats, however, always depend upon platforms, on data ontologies, on regulative frameworks, so you cannot prevent biases. Um, the big data cannot capture everything. It is pre-formatted. The second claim is uh, now that we have big data, there is no need for a priori theory, models or hypothesis. Again, Kitchen argues um, and, and puts emphasis on the role of scientific methods for the generation of data, for the creation of algorithms and methods. So it's not that this is not necessary anymore. A third claim is that through the application of agnostic data analytics, the data can speak for themselves, free of human bias or framing, and that any patterns and relationships within big data are inherently meaningful and truthful. Again, Kitchen argues that the generation of meaning is always situated in methods and compass preconceptions about what the data are for or how to interpret them. So even in the age of big data, he writes, <clears throat> we can't get rid of human biases or framing uh, patterns. Fourth, meaning transcends context or domain-specific knowledge, thus can be interpreted by anyone who can decode a statistic or data visualization. And here Kitchen uh, draws particular attention to the necessity for um, of domain-specific knowledge, which is very much essential for good research. And um, what I realized when I review some of the um, computational social science um, 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 papers for journals, etc., is very often that if the papers are coming, um, well, sometimes you would have uh, computer scientists now trying to explain social science research, um, but then not necessarily having uh, the right toolbox of sociological th theories or rather considering them to be unnecessary. My argument is not that social science can do everything better. My argument is rather that what we need is, is very strong coalitions of people from social science and humanities and computer science working together to combine the best of all worlds, but not to replace what has been discovered in the social science and humanities by um, purely computational methods. So it's not about an, what is better suited, but rather we need to think about new ways of working together. So to summarize <clears throat> these two contrasting uh, approaches, uh, this new empiricism would claim that data can speak for itself, it's free of theory, that correlation supersedes causality, uh, they would be advocating purely inductive methods, uh, but what can be said is that this hype about new empiricism is much less received in research because most examples are really from business and marketing uh, concerning predictive analytics. Um, Kitchen contrasts this with digital uh, humanities and computational social, social science, which for him um, encompasses much more hybrid approaches, combining induction, deduction, and abduction. Um, induction would be used to generate hypotheses um, prior to deduction. It would be situated and contextualized research. And this, as you can imagine, is Kitchen, Kitchen's favorite big data epistemology, which is clearly contrasted to the epistemology advocated by new empiricism. What is important is that he really puts emphasis on the necessity to reflect upon the epistemological consequences of big data. And what he's drawing on is um, the field of critical GIS studies uh, and radical statistics. And I want to show you one very long quote um, that he, from his article, but which I think is very useful to understand his position and also to see already what I what I want to uh, want to put emphasis on some some feminist concerns about uh, big data practices, in particular related to this linkage between knowledge and power. So Kitchen writes: <clears throat> Research is not a neutral, objective activity that produces a view from nowhere. There is an inherent politics pervading the data sets analyzed, the research conducted, and the interpretations made. The researcher is acknowledged to possess a certain positionality with respect to their knowledge, experience, beliefs, aspirations, etc. That the research is situated within disciplinary debates, the funding landscape, wider societal politics, etc. The data are reflective of the technique used to generate them and hold certain characteristics relating to sampling and ontological frames, data cleanliness, completeness, consistency, veracity and fidelity. And the methods of analysis utilized produce particular effects with respect to the results produced and interpretations made. <coughs> Moreover, it is recognized that how the research is employed is not ideologically neutral, but is framed in subtle and explicit ways by the aspirations and intentions 
of the researchers and funders, sponsors, and those that translate such research into various forms of policy instruments and actions. Let me now turn to a second example from a different field, namely big data and biology, and I'm drawing here on a book by Sabina Leonelli. It's actually an article, not a book, sorry. In this article, she is describing biology as a fragmented and pluralist research field with myriads of epistemic communities with different methods, locations, materials, background knowledge, amount and types of data about unstable organisms and ecosystems. However, within biology, there's a strong push towards big data, especially in genomics. And the example that she's analyzing in detail are model organisms databases to store and disseminate genomic data about, uh, about different species, such as the flybase example, which I gave you before. <coughs> the goals of these databases are threefold. To incorporate and integrate any data available on the biology of the organism into question within a single resource, including data on physiology, metabolism, and even morphology. Second, allowing and promoting cooperation with other community databases so that the available datasets would eventually be comparable across species. And third, gathering information about laboratories working on each organism and the associated experimental protocols, materials and instruments, thus providing a platform for community building. So what is happening now if you want to um, put this data on a specific, let's assume you have data and you want to put this into the database. In the first stage, the researcher possessing data, let's say on a specific type of fruit fly, uh, needs to decontextualize the data. The goal is of course to format the data that is available from experimental results or whatever to make it suited for travel, to make it compatible and easy to analyze for other researchers who did not generate the data beforehand. The problem is that there are no real standards for the formatting of this data, and this is also a very labor-intense process. That means it is also an expensive process because you would need to pay the researchers to do this type of formatting. Moreover, there are very few incentives for data donation, because if you think about the reputation economy of science, what counts really is that you publish papers in reputable journals, but not necessarily that you donate data to a database. Right? This is not valued as a as a very uh, useful contribution to the community. The second stage, of course, on the side now of the database is to recontextualize the data that they have received. That means they need to select and annotate metadata, for instance, regarding the provenance of the data. Sometimes it will be necessary to capture the experimental protocols, and since this is very different, uh, difficult sometimes and need to be very specific, video formats may need to be used. Here again, the establishment of standards is very necessary, but difficult again, and this process is even more labor-intense than the previous stage 1 decontextualization. <coughs> the third stage then is reuse. Currently only few datasets are suited for this type of processing that leads to a selection and bias according to the type of data generation. What this basically means is that specific types of biology namely genetics, produce data that is more suited for these databases, right? And this may lead to, um, what do you, what do you call this, to, um, uh, to a type of, of re-evaluation or favorization of, of specific type of data. Um, moreover, as always is the case with classification in bioontologists, there is a challenge of pre-formatting. On the one hand, you need to pre-format a database to make it uh, usable. On the other hand, by this pre-formatting, you can preclude future uses. So, in a nutshell, if you want to look at big data and biology, there seems to be enormous manual work involved in this type of big data processes. So there are really discrepancies between the possibilities and the realities of big data. Part of the reason is that there's little support for online databases and there are very few incentives for data donation in big data. So despite the fact that lots of data is generated in these databases, we are still talking about rather small data in contrast to the um, more, more uh, substantive amounts of data in other fields. What this 
what is interesting that this already tells us a little bit about the relationship between power and knowledge in the realms of big data. Because the digital divide may be alive and well, even within biology, because there may be biases in data collection, for instance, through the, dom the dominance of genetic data, which is better suited for traveling than other types of data. There may, as a result, be novel epistemic hierarchies in science related to the data gathering, processing and formatting. Uh, and this is also, of course, the case in simulations and modeling and sustainability research, where data that can be fed into the computer are much, have a much higher chance to be important or considered to be relevant, uh, whereas other type of data, which is more difficult to, to, to gather and to format, uh, may lose uh, credence and relevance. So to summarize big data and science, we can say that the impact of big data on epistemic practices, on knowledge practices, differs profoundly between and within academic disciplines. There is more continuity in biological research due to long experience in big data processing, and there may be more profound implications in social science and humanities. And what both authors claim is that potentially there may be even bigger impact on, of big data analytics on politics and business with regards to prediction and decision making. And this is what I want to turn now to for the last, uh, for the last minutes of my presentation. So, of course, big data is not only um, collected in, in science and academia, but also by states. And if you think about the history um, of states, or the history of statistics more precisely, you will, you will um, probably understand that uh, churches and states have been the primary informational agents uh, for the longest time in human history. The church is basically recording who was born, who the parents were, who died, uh, how many children were born, etc. And later on, states basically gathering all sorts of data about um, their, their citizens. Um, and I have a quote here actually from Wikipedia, um, which is, by the 18th century, the term statistics designated the systematic collection of democratic, demographic and economic data by states. And in a very important or interesting book by Alain Desrosiers, The Politics of Large Numbers, he also writes, as the etymology of the word shows, statistics is connected with the construction of the state, with its unification and administration. The need to know a nation in order to govern it led to the organization of official bureaus and statistics. So he's basically, in this book, Desrosiers is providing a history of the development of statistics in France, uh, England, and Germany, showing what the differences but also the similarities were. And he's closely tying this development of statistics also to the emergence of nation states. What this really can show us is that you can read the history of states also as a history of statistics and data gathering and processing. And I think what this should also uh, make us aware of is the linkages between knowledge and power. Because really, if you, if you, if you read recent uh, books on big data, such as Sandy Pantland's Social Physics, there's always also this link between governance and knowledge and power, and to what extent you need big data analy analytics to govern states and, and uh, to, to make decisions. So what I wanted to show you is that even in the early days, the very early days of statistics, there has always been this link between statistics and, um, um, and, and governance. And this, of course, is the same uh, today. There has been this recent White House report on big data, which just came out this May. <clears throat> and the authors write, but these capabilities, most of which are not visible or available to the average consumer, also create an asymmetry of power between those who hold the data and those who intentionally or inadvertently supply it. Let me turn now to the companies who, are, of course, have emerged um, after science and states now as major uh, information, uh, information gatherers. Of course, the usual suspects that people are always thinking about are data, uh, Google and Facebook, but of course, there are numerous other uh, big data gatherers which are rather in the background, which we are not aware of, which are constantly gathering data through different means, uh, online data, but also transaction data, etc. So it would be a mistake to only focus on, uh, on the few visible ones, such as Facebook and Google. We need to think, on, if we think of big data, we need to think about infrastructure, we need to think about all types of underlying and embedded forms of data gathering. Of course, finally, 
who's always in the loop are the users because they are involved in this process of data gathering, predominantly through their mobile phones, but also through different types of apps and self-tracking devices, uh, etc. So if you want to summarize this picture, it's basically the user who, through their practices, provide the data which can then uh, be assessed. And of course, I didn't talk about PRISM and the latest uh, scandals, the NSA-related scandals. But what should be clear is um, that you have these powerful players, be it nation states, but also companies, um, who are now gathering and processing the data that we are supplying and providing voluntarily or inadvertently. Uh, both is happening. And academia, uh, which I symbolized by a picture of the University of Vienna on the, on the lower left, is basically a little bit left out of the picture because um, they, researchers hardly have access to the vast amounts of data that companies nowadays have. So what I wanted to show you is what we need really is uh, to have very domain-specific analysis if we want to think about big data because uh, the different collectors have very different functions and implications. What I want to just point you to before I end is that there is a new journal which just came out, uh, which was just launched a few weeks ago, Big Data and Society. So if you're interested in the topic and want to submit something on big data from a critical social science perspective, or not only social science, but an interdisciplinary perspective, this could be a venue. Uh, and I'm just going to point you to we are interested really in very fun fundamental or foundational questions related to, related to data methods, data epistemologies, and data ontologies. All these questions and examples you can find on the website. I just wanted to point you to, before I conclude, we're interested in data politics, data economics, and data ecologies. And as I said, just take a look at the website uh, of the journal. We also have a blog, and maybe you can find something interesting there, or maybe you just want to submit also something, which would be fabulous. All right, so let me come to my conclusions. What I wanted to argue for is that knowledge practices today have to be considered as socio-technical epistemic practices. And to adequately capture such practices, the major topics in social epistemology need to be reconsidered in socio-technical terms. Moreover, new topics and fields of inquiry for social epistemology have emerged due to recent developments regarding technologies of information, computa computation and communication, which really need to be put under epistemological scrutiny uh, when it comes to my, my understanding. Many of these developments, and big data has just been the one example on which I, which I put more emphasis right now, they require relating epistemology to ethics, ontology, and politics, and also economics, which is a point that I did not really uh, talk about today, but I think which is increasingly needs to be reconsidered as well. And what I do is I suggest the label socio-technical epistemology for this new field of inquiry in philosophy, which I wanted to present you today and which I hope you find found interesting uh, and I'm now open uh, for questions, and I hope that our Skype connection works so that you can ask me some questions. Many thanks for your attention.